Hey everyone, Will here. So for today's video, we are going to be analyzing the CIA assassination attempts on Cuban dictator Fidel Castro. That means we're going to be going over all aspects of these previously classified operations, including why the CIA was so adamant on killing Castro, how the CIA attempted to kill Castro, and the impact these failed assassination efforts had on United States-Cuban relations moving forward. So without further ado, let's begin. So the story behind the assassination attempts originated back in the 1950s, after the United States first established a military and financial presence in Cuba following the Spanish-American War. The U.S. attempted to expand their control over the Republic of Cuba by backing Cuban military dictator Fulgencio Batista's occupation of the territory. Batista ruled over Cuba through a series of puppet presidents and then was later elected president of Cuba himself. During World War II, President Batista reinforced his support for the U.S. after Japan's attack on Pearl Harbor by joining the Allied powers with Cuba on December 9, 1941. Unfortunately for Batista, he swiftly lost re-election to Ramon Grau in 1944. After World War II ended in 1945, the U.S. began to increase its presence in international relations. This increased presence was enacted through the creation of the Central Intelligence Agency, also known as the CIA. After World War II, the Soviet Union also increased its own presence in international relations. The Soviet Union accomplished this by establishing communist regimes in Eastern Europe. They also accomplished this by installing communist dictatorships in Romania and Bulgaria. These actions led to widespread fear of communism across the U.S. This fear and the reaction to it would later become known as the Red Scare. As this was all happening, former Cuban President Fulgencio Batista plotted his way back to power. In 1952, he reclaimed his authority over Cuba by launching a military coup right before Cuba's 1952 presidential election. Seventeen days after Batista's revolution, the U.S. government officially recognized Batista's government as the government of Cuba. Within days of his successful military coup, Batista canceled all future presidential elections in Cuba and announced that Cuba would henceforth be known as a disciplined democracy. Reacting to this news, many Cubans despised the idea of a one-man dictatorship and feared further U.S. involvement in Cuban politics. A particular concern for many Cubans was the economic influence U.S. businesses were gaining over Cuba's economy. All of these factors led to the rise of an armed movement led by Fidel Castro, known as the 26th of July movement. After staging a successful revolution, Fidel Castro became Prime Minister of Cuba in 1959. As Prime Minister, Castro similarly led with an authoritarian outlook by eliminating the free press, executing political prisoners, and initiating LGBTQ plus concentration camps. Fidel Castro also became a major irritation to U.S. government officials because of his domestic and international initiatives. Fidel Castro took many radical measures that angered U.S. officials, such as nationalizing oil refineries to produce oil specifically for the Soviet Union, nationalizing U.S. business assets and banks in Cuba, and forming a strong alliance with the Soviet Union. These things all made the U.S. Central Intelligence Agency launch a variety of missions to end Fidel Castro's political influence over Cuba. Now before plotting to kill Fidel Castro, CIA agents planned a more covert plan to take Castro out of power by undermining his natural charm. This started with a plan to break into Castro's private hotel and put thallium salts in his boots. This powder would hypothetically cause Castro to lose his beard, eyebrows, and hair. However, before the CIA enacted this mission, 
they chose to abandon the project in favor of more recent ideas. The CIA's next attempt to undermine Fidel Castro's leadership came into play when they planned to spray an LSD drug in a TV station where Castro would be filmed. They planned to do this to make Castro hallucinate and freak out on live TV. Similarly, however, the CIA also rejected this plan. When astronaut John Glenn launched into space, the CIA considered blaming Fidel Castro for blasting the American module with magnetic rays. This plan was eventually scrapped, however, when John Glenn came back to Earth safely. After this plan failed, the CIA decided it would be best to deal with Castro by assassinating him rather than by undermining his political influence. Now, according to Fidel Castro's head of intelligence, Fabian Escalante, from 1960 to 2000, the CIA launched 638 assassination attempts on Castro's life. Now, despite these rumors, it must be noted that there is no official confirmation of this data from the CIA today. Most CIA operations launched at this time still remain a mystery to this day. Despite this, however, a 1975 report by the U.S. Senate Church Committee confirms many of the CIA-sponsored assassination attempts on Castro's life. The first attempt on Fidel Castro's life took place when the CIA offered a man who planned to meet with Castro a grand sum of $10,000 for his murder. This attempt failed since the man never got the chance to meet Castro. The second assassination attempt took place in 1961 and was much more creative than the last attempt. In this attempt, the U.S. manufactured cigars with the dose of botulinum toxin, a deadly poison that would have killed Castro once it was in his mouth. According to the U.S. Senate Church Committee's report, the cigars were then handed off to an unidentified person. After that, the record ended no further details of the plot provided to the general public. In the early 1960s, the CIA approved of a new assassination plan, this time partnering with three high-profile mafia leaders, Johnny Rosselli, Salvatore Giancana, and Santo Traficante. Two of these mobsters, Salvatore Giancana and Santo Traficante, were notorious criminals who were on the FBI's most wanted list. Over the course of this partnership, the CIA worked to keep their involvement hidden by sending special agent Robert Mayhew to meet with the mobsters. Mayhew pretended to be a representative on behalf of several international businesses in Cuba. On September 14, 1960, Mayhew offered the mobsters $150,000 for eliminating Castro but Johnny Rosselli declined the pay since he saw the chance to kill Fidel Castro as an honor. According to leaked CIA information, mobster Salvatore Giancana came up with the plan to put poison pills in Castro's food and drink. These pills were manufactured by the CIA's technical division to ensure that they were extremely deadly and untraceable. The CIA distributed many of these pills to an ally of Giancana named Juan Orta, who was a government official that was close to Castro. Despite the strong coordination, the CIA failed in each attempt they made on Castro's life. In their closest assassination attempt, the Mafia enlisted the help of an assassin posing as a waiter. One of Fidel Castro's favorite desserts was the chocolate milkshake. When Castro ordered a chocolate milkshake at the restaurant, the assassin was told to put the poison pill in the drink. However, when the assassin went to retrieve the poison pill, he realized it had gotten stuck in the freezer. When the assassin tried to pull it loose, he accidentally ripped the pill and ruined the plan. After these repeated failures, the CIA chose to adopt an even crazier plan. Their next idea was to rig a seashell with high capacity explosives and then place it in a known swimming location used by Castro. The CIA later abandoned this plan, opting for an even more ambitious idea. 
the CIA's next attempt had a similar oceanic theme to it. In their next attempt, the CIA infected a scuba diving suit with tuberculosis and planned to convince Castro to use it in his next scuba diving trip. However, according to the leaked CIA documents, this suit never left the CIA's laboratory. The CIA's next attempt was very lethal as well. In this attempt, the CIA recruited an anonymous, high-ranking Cuban leader, giving him a ballpoint pen that had a hidden hypodermic needle in it. Upon clicking the pen, the needle would inject poison into Castro, killing him instantly. However, before doing this, the Cuban leader became very afraid that he would accidentally stab himself with it, and instead, he chose to discard the pen altogether. After that, the CIA formulated a new plan. This plan entailed distributing a gun with a custom silencer to the same Cuban government official that discarded the ballpoint pen earlier. Ironically, the Cuban leader again chose to abandon his mission, cutting ties with the CIA. According to a 1993 news piece in Vanity Fair, another uncovered assassination attempt involved Castro's ex-lover, Marita Lorenz. With overnight access to Castro's home, Lorenz sounded like an ideal assassin for the CIA to utilize. CIA agent Frank Sturgis, a key player in the Watergate scandal, quickly made contact with Lorenz, persuading her to assassinate Castro. At first, she gladly accepted this deal. Sturgis provided Lorenz with two pills that could kill Castro in a matter of minutes. However, when Lorenz arranged a meeting with Castro, he immediately predicted why she had returned. According to Lorenz, Castro then handed her a gun and taunted her to shoot him. Castro then followed this action with an iconic quote, No one can kill me. No one. Ever. Castro stated. To Lorenz's surprise, Castro was right. She had loved Castro too much to kill him. Lorenz then chose to stay the night with Castro. In the morning, Fidel Castro left Marita Lorenz, never seeing her again. In the end, Fidel Castro reportedly died of natural causes at the age of 90, under the U.S. presidency of Barack Obama. It is quite ironic that after more than 40 years of coordinated assassination attempts, Fidel Castro nevertheless lived an incredibly long life. The fallout from the CIA's assassination attempts on Fidel Castro were major. The U.S. Senate Church Committee recommended that Congress erect a federal statute that prohibited secret government-sponsored assassination attempts on foreign leaders. Unfortunately for this committee, however, no such statue was ever introduced. U.S. President Gerald Ford did, however, sign Executive Order 11905, which states that no employee of the United States government should engage in or conspire in political assassination. It is notable to state that no CIA assassination attempts on Fidel Castro occurred under U.S. President Gerald Ford. Following these developments, U.S. President Jimmy Carter strengthened this executive protocol by signing Executive Order 12036 into effect. This executive order was notable for creating new oversight committees and restrictions on the U.S. Central Intelligence community. This law was passed to try to ensure that the CIA operated within the boundaries of U.S. law. Despite this, some wonder if the administrations of President Carter and other presidents truly did abide by the terms in Executive Orders 11905 and 12036. In a British Channel 4 television documentary called 638 Ways to Kill Castro, Cuban counterintelligence chief Fabian Escalante estimated the number of assassination attempts launched against Castro during each U.S. presidency. According to Escalante, 38 assassination attempts occurred under President Dwight D. Eisenhower, 42 assassination attempts occurred under President John F. Kennedy, 
72 assassination attempts occurred under President Lyndon B. Johnson, 184 attempts occurred under President Richard Nixon, 64 occurred under President Jimmy Carter, 197 occurred under President Ronald Reagan, 16 occurred under President George H.W. Bush, and 21 occurred under President Bill Clinton. The remaining four supposed assassination attempts remain uncredited to any particular president's administration, according to Escalante. Today, the implications from these assassination attempts are major. United States-Cuban relations faced substantial tension throughout recent history. Cuba's position as a key player was undermined, however, after the collapse of their major ally, the Soviet Union, in 1991. In 2015, under the administration of U.S. President Barack Obama, the U.S. established both a Cuban embassy in Washington, D.C. and an American embassy in Havana. This marked substantial progress in United States-Cuban diplomatic efforts. Overall, the past assassination attempts on Fidel Castro and the Cuban Missile Crisis have both had a major impact on United States-Cuban relations. Thank you for checking out our video! If you enjoyed this video, please leave a like, comment, and subscribe for more additional content. If you have any ideas for a future video topic, please leave a comment and let me know what you would like to see me cover next. I'm really hoping to grow this channel and provide you all with more content in the future, and your support means the world to me. Thanks everyone!